Open your Bibles with me to Luke 14. And I did a a sprint through Luke 14 all the way to verse 24 last week. And uh, this week we're going to pick up where we left off in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35, finishing out the 14th chapter of Luke with a sermon entitled, The Cost of Following. I want to give you uh, a quick review as we've, um, we've, as I said, sprinted through uh, chapter 14. It is a, a shorter chapter in Luke's gospel, but up until this point, um, it appears that everything has occurred in the same place. Uh, if you look back at uh, verse 1 of chapter 14, it tells us that Jesus went to the chief Pharisee's house and all of these episodes and parables occurred within um, this one location. Now, as we enter into verse 25, uh, we have a, a change of our setting and our location, possibly, as Jesus turns to the multitudes. But up to this point, we've seen um, the hostility towards Jesus from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those leaders within the church, and how they have at every turn been looking to catch him in lawlessness and unrighteousness. We've also seen just recently as uh, chapter 13 came to a close, how Jesus was told to get out of town because Herod was coming and this government official would put him surely to death. And again, Jesus butts up against that authority as well. And so he, up to this point, we've seen uh, the hostility from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We've seen the government hostility in Herod. And now we turn in verse 25 to hostility, not that is aimed at Jesus, but I think that Jesus intends to create. Uh, it, it seems that Jesus is, is, a, uh, is a mover and, and shaker, a, a wave maker, that he would, oh, I just cut through really big. Wow, that was exciting. Uh, that he would really um, rile up the crowds even sometimes and combat against them. That even in his popularity, he would try to give the harsher and harder message. Um, so let's look together at verses 25 through 35 and see one more, I wouldn't say enemy of Christ, but certainly a group of people who find themselves adversely affected by the gospel message. Verse 25 begins this way. And there were gr- there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a way off, he sendeth an ambassage, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus now, after the Pharisee's house, it's not clear whether it is in the Pharisee's house, in the courtyards, or in the house roundabout, or if this is a completely different uh, setting and scenario altogether with Jesus. But in this moment, he turns not to those with all the pool, but rather to the multitudes, the crowds that have been following him. Verse 25 goes this way, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. Jesus has amassed at this point many followers. It seems every chapter gives us a word or a phrase that points us back to the number of people that are following Christ. It's people who are smashed on top of each other. They're walking on top of each other. There's so many, Luke says. It's uh, crowds that are surrounding the house that Jesus has to push through. Uh, These terms come up again and again, and now it is the term, there went great multitudes with him. Not just a multitude, but multitudes, that this is a very large crowd made up of many different types of people. And as these people go with him, As the crowds get bigger, as Jesus' popularity continues to soar, instead of giving the easier message, 
Jesus preaches the harder one. And when worldly people who begin to have more and more followers begin to amass a greater popularity, we see the exact opposite. Um, I'm in the school system, so I see it firsthand with kids. Um, You've maybe seen it on TV, these just wild stories of teenagers who through Instagram or TikTok or whatever social media they're a part of, their life begins to center around how many followers do I have? How many people are watching me and and engaging with my content online and everything else in their world begins to shut down? It begins to become, how can I post more stuff on Instagram? How can I post stuff that people are going to like? How can I doctor every part of who I am and what my life is about that people would love and like me more? These people are gluttons for attention. They want to be more popular. And it's not just children, but we see it with celebrities and stars as well. I mean, how many Christian musicians, when they get that taste of the spotlight in the worldly stage, will completely sell everything, just give it all up to be the biggest and best star that they can be? Many times they push reality out of the way. How many of these stars, when they get to a certain point, begin to have say things and do things that no normal person would do because we live in reality. We don't operate on some pedestal. But for many, it's this celebrity, this popularity that begins to drive them not to cast people away, but instead, how can I get more and more people to follow? And as the multitudes come to Jesus, we would expect as the man Jesus, if he was only but a man, that he would encourage more followers to come with him. In fact, if he has the Jewish mindset of what he's about to do is to go to Jerusalem and overthrow the capital city and reinstate the kingdom as the Messiah he claims to be, that he would want more people on his side. This is something for the Jewish people that any false Messiah would try to get as many people as he can, that he might be the best success that he can be when he gets to the capital city, when he goes up against the largest army in the world. But instead, Jesus does not do the worldly thing. Jesus, as he turns his face to Jerusalem and the task that he has before him, does not seek to get anybody and he doesn't make his message more palatable that we might be able to hear it and do what do it more easily that we might come along instead Jesus gives us a much di- more difficult message as the crowds get larger Jesus seeks to thin them out by his message Jesus does the opposites as the crowds increased his message became less palatable not more And in fact, that's what Jesus says the message of the gospel should be. If you'll flip in your New Testament with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, we have a prophecy from Paul to Timothy about what the last days will look like. And these are the days that we live in even now. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3 is one that you have probably heard before. 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 says this, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. The prophecy is that there's a day coming when it won't be based on the soundness of theology, the literal reading of God's word and the faithful preaching thereof, but that there will be many who by popularity, by tickling or itching ears, making people feel good, that there will be masses who will follow. And certainly, if we look at the most populous churches in Christendom, it is led by pastors who oftentimes, what do they do best but tickle ears? Joel Osteen's church. He is but simply a good feeling, good vibes type of pastor. He has a message that Sometimes can border on the gospel, but most of the time borders on this uh, this idea of health and wealth, prosperity teaching. It's departed from sound doctrine and instead seeks to tickle ears. But his crowds, you would think that he is one who has been a successful preacher, that he is one who is bringing in the crowds like Jesus did. But the key difference is that Jesus didn't make his message less like sound doctrine. Instead, he made it even more difficult. 
to follow. I think if we know anything from 2 Timothy 4.3, I think it implies that the message of the gospel ought to make you uncomfortable. I think that's one thing that um, I like about our church is people want to have their toes stepped on. They don't want their ears tickled. They know very well that if they don't leave feeling convicted and, and, and touched by the gospel, and it hurts, that there's something that I need to correct, that I haven't achieved perfection, and I need to leave this place saying, how can I be different? This is something we desire. It, it, it's, it's good to feel the pain and to say, this is a good thing. This is something that, that teaches me and changes me rather than a church that would say, well, that gospel, that's, that's kind of offensive. Let's find us a, another preacher or a, another teacher who would do something a little better, would make it a little more palatable. And this is not what Jesus does. Instead, he ups the ante. Verse 26, he begins his teaching to the crowds. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. And Jesus' words are meant to get that reaction. Did Jesus just say hate? And this, first of all, before I even describe, because some of us may find offense to this word, Jesus wants you to find offense, but I want you to, I'm going to just a second explain exactly what Jesus means. He uses a very specific term for hate, but I, I want us also to put this up against the Jesus of our culture today, because there's a world out there who would say that they're Christians, but they haven't read very much of the Bible at all, because they would be the Christians who would say, Jesus doesn't say anything about hell, when in fact, Jesus speaks more about hell than any other person in the Bible. They would say that Jesus is, is some, some, some hippie who talks about peace and love all the time, when Jesus does not speak about these types of things. In fact, this message of hatred in verse 26, laughs and spits in the face of this hippie of peace, Jesus, this love only type of Jesus. This is the Jesus again, and this seems to be the Jesus we run into more often than the loving Jesus in Luke's gospel. Yes, he is a Jesus of love and compassion, but more so, I think overarching, at least this is what I find when I read scripture, is that he's the Lord of wrath. That he has come to a people who hate him, and by his mercy and love, he lays his life down. But all the while, he's talking smack. He, he, he's the Jesus who, who brings the sword. He's the Jesus who is going to tell you like it is. This is the Jesus of verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not. Jesus is calling verse 26 is to hate people. So let's look at what does the word mean. This Greek word, meseo, strongest concordance defines this way. Properly to detest on a, here's the key word, comparative basis. So this word hate is a comparison. It is not telling us to hate people, but rather this type of hatred is hate them in comparison to the love that you have for something else. It continues this way, hence denounce, to love someone or something less than someone or something else to renounce one choice in favor of another. In these terms, and if I could just make it so, so childish and simple, um, I love hamburgers. I hate pizza is the way Jesus uses this example here. I love pizza too, uh, but I, I love hamburgers a whole lot more. In, in this comparative analysis here, Jesus is saying this one thing is more important than this other thing. And so the comparison in verse 26 that he uses this term, and I, it is a shocking term. He uses this word hate to rile us up and to say, wait a minute, to really turn our introspect on ourselves and to say, what does Jesus mean here? But here's how he means it in verse 26. If any man come to me, that's the one you got to love. That's the one that's got to be first choice. If you love me, but you hate not your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brethren, your sisters, and even your own life, you can't be my disciple. Comparatively, yes. I mean, doesn't the Gospels, doesn't the Epistles, doesn't the Bible over and over again tell us to love God, love neighbor? Doesn't it say that you are not a part of Christ if you do not love the brethren? I mean, there's a lot of love in there. But comparatively, 
Who is first choice? Who is most important? Who is it that we should love more than anything else? Jesus is saying, how can you love all of these things and lump me in with them? How can you love all of these things and come to me as just a fraction of your time and your energy and your effort? How can you give all of these things mounds and mounds of time and energy and love and come to me as not even second, but third, but fourth, but fifth choice, but last resort? Jesus is saying comparatively, if you love all of these things and I'm just another one on the list, that's not enough. The hatred Jesus talks about is one that detests the things of the world in comparison to the one who is greater. And there are many people who fall into this condemnation of Jesus in verse 26. There are people who put spouse above everything else. And this is a love that is ordained in Genesis that is continued throughout Scripture. But Christ is pretty clear here that the love that you have for your spouse ought not to trump him. And it's a very difficult thing that we are to, to transition that in our life. It should be a day-by-day thing to say, Lord, how can I love you more? But he is much greater than any temporal, earthly thing that we might love. There's people who put children first, who put their family first, who put, Jesus says, their own life first. And if we were to compare all of these scenarios, this is not what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus is saying, I've got to be first. And being having Jesus first is not a thing where we say, well, Jesus will be first on Sunday, Jesus will be first on Wednesday, Jesus will be first for this hour, and then I'll go back to regular ordinary life. To have Jesus first means to put him first in all things. And y'all, there is a way to love spouse, to love family, to love children, all the while while loving Jesus first. If we love our spouse and love our children and love our family through the lens of scripture, we're going to find that do, the greatest love that we can impart to people is through the lens of how Jesus first loves us. In Ephesians, where Paul talks about the role of husband and the role of, of wife, it is not simply, this is how things ought to be. I said so. It's, I've shown you so. I am God. You are my church. I have loved you so much that I would lay my life down for you, that you're my bride. That we get this picture in Revelation of the bride, the church, coming down in heaven for this great wedding feast with the Lord. These are all of the symbols and the things through which we ought to view this symbol and this reality that we live. If we're not living our life through the lens of Scripture, We're going to fail every time. We're going to put people like our spouse and our children and our family and ourselves on pedestals as greater idols who we serve much more diligently and obediently than we serve Christ. And so Jesus turns to the multitudes and he says, great thing you're following me here, but do you love me more than literally anything else? If not, You can't be my disciple. And I think it's those last words that show us exactly what verse 26 ought to be. He cannot be my disciple. Verse 26 is, yes, a call to love Jesus more than anything else. But it's also a way in which we can look and say, by this I know a disciple of God. Do you put everything before Jesus? Is Jesus first place in your life? If a person makes a claim that I am saved, I'm a follower of Jesus, I love Jesus, back it up. Can you prove it? Can that person prove that they're a follower of Christ? Because Jesus says, you can't be my disciple if you put all of these things first. This is a way in which we can look at Scripture and Jesus is saying, how do you identify? Can you say you are a disciple? Because this is the basis for what it takes. This is the most important thing. But Jesus' difficult message does not just stop in verse 26 with a call to deny all the aspects of one's life. It continues in verse 27 with an equally difficult message. Verse 27, 
And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The first thing that verse 27 is, is a prophecy. Jesus has not identified, uh, not that I'm aware of, maybe we'd have to go back and watch all the videos that Kenneth's ever recorded and, and edited and put up so that we could see exactly what I've said and what I haven't, but I'm pretty confident that this is the first time in Scripture, in, in Luke's gospel at least, that Jesus has identified the means by which he is going to die. For the crowds, they simply hear the cross and they think the torture device, the, the, the instrument of death that is the cross, that is crucifixion. They don't put it with the Savior who will soon die on the cross. But Jesus is prophesying of something greater here. He's saying, if, if this is all about loving God more, he's saying, I am going to take up my cross. I am going to prove that I love you more than you could ever love me, that I would lay down my life on the cross and die for you. And we hear that and we say, can you do the same? But for the crowds here, and, and also for us, is the very difficult message of suffering. Many want to come to Jesus for all sorts of reasons, but here Jesus says, can you come to me? given a call to die. Symbolically, Jesus is saying, can you die to yourself and live for me? Can you bear your cross, carry an instrument of death and torture on your back? That's the price to follow me. Jesus is saying, are you willing to pay the ultimate price to be my disciple? Because that's what it's going to take. If you're not willing to bear your cross, if you're not willing to come after me with the instrument of death, then you cannot be my disciple. But likewise, it's a call and a willingness to die as Jesus will die. If the call was, really, lay down your life, would you be willing to do that for Jesus? Because the Christian life, Jesus says, I think if there's one thing we can take away from the Gospels, it's that the Christian life is not supposed to be an easy one. But it's one that is riddled with difficulty and tragedy and hard choices. Many people come to Jesus thinking it is going to be a very easy choice, but not many people take into consideration all of the things that it entails. Are you willing to bear your cross? Are you willing to even go to the point of death for Jesus? He's calling us to deny every aspect of our life, to deny all of our even good stuff, but suffering with it. Are we willing to do all of these things? And Jesus gives us a few, you know, I love the word parables, parables in verses 28 through 33 in order to give us kind of some logic and reasoning for why he wants us to do these things. He doesn't simply give them the hard message, but he explains why the message has to be hard. Verse 28 begins this way. Four. In response to what I've just said, here is some logic, some reasoning for who this, this makes sense in reality. For which of you intending to build a tower? So he's likening being a disciple of Christ to building a tower. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. So the first illustration is the man who sits down to build the tower. Well, it could be for us a house. It could be for us uh, whatever thing we, 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 whatever project we like to take on. And Jesus says, what are some things that you do in order to make sure that your project goes the way it ought to go? Verse 28 says, sitteth not down first. The first thing you got to do is you got to plan it out. You got you to gotta think of how all of these things are going to unfold. What are you going to need to do to be successful in the project? But also, and here's the most important part, and counteth the cost, whether we ha he have sufficient to finish it. You can't just build the tower, start the project, do whatever with the grand plan. You got to have the capital to get it done. 
And Jesus is saying, you have to sit down and plan. You have to consider the cost of doing this project, lest what will happen. Verse 29, you'll lay the foundation, you'll do a piece of the job, and then you'll recognize either A, your planning was insufficient, you have no plan outside of, I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay the foundation, but I have no idea how I'm going to get the walls up, how I'm going to go 17 stories high, how I'm going to have floors in between, what I'm going to put in this building, how, how, how I'm going to make it beautiful. All I've got is the foundation. Or B, you lay the foundation and then you recognize just a piece of this structure cost all that I had. I have no means or way of finishing it. Does it matter the grand plan that I have? I have all the schematics, but I have none of the money to get it done. And when that happens, verse 29 says, what's going to happen? But everybody's going to mock. This is a person who, 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 who thought that they could accomplish this great task and they didn't have the plan or they didn't have the means to do it. Now it's just this ugly concrete slab that has nothing around it. This man was beginning, began to build and was not able to finish. Without calculating the cost, the job can't be done. Likewise, verse 31 and 32, another example, or what king going to make a war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he will be able with 10,000 to meet with them that cometh against him with 20,000. It's the king who sends his warriors into battle and he is outmatched in number of troops and he has no plan for how he is going to get the job done. He's just hoping that his guys are stronger than the others, that they're smarter and Just go at it. The cost of lives, the cost of ammunition, the cost of all of of this war. I'm going to waste it all on the hope that they'll be successful. Verse 32, or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. And then the the curveball in verse 32 is, and what if the other guy comes in and wants peace? And now you've gone to war for nothing. And so here is Jesus' logic, his examples for why you ought to be a disciple. And we might read this and we may say, what in the world does this mean? <laughs> what do these parables have to do? What does building a tower have to do with building a, being a disciple of Christ? What does a king going to war have to do with being a disciple of Christ? Many want to come to Jesus for what it gets them, but they never consider what it will cost them. Many come to church and they walk the aisle and they say, I want to follow Jesus because I want a seat at the table. I want a seat at the pews. I want a, I want a church family who will rally around me. I I, I want to go in and I want to eat the fried chicken on Sunday morning. And I, I just want, I just want to have a good time. I just want to be a part of the country club at first Baptist church, Brooklyn. You came to church because of what it'll get you, but you never thought of the cost of what following Jesus actually means for you. Many people want to come to church because it gives them the the attention of others. Because when they walk this aisle, when they get dunked in in the baptistry, when they get doted on by the church, man, that is a moment to be proud of. That's that's many a child who would walk the pews, I mean, walk walk the aisle, unfortunately, is they saw brother, sister, cousin, friend walk the aisle, and they say, well, you mean all I got to do for everybody to look at me is walk up there? And unfortunately, people make decisions not ever considering the cost and only thinking, what is in it for me? Many people, especially in their careers and especially uh, many a year ago when the world and especially the United States was, was a Christian nation and most people in it were Christian and being Christian meant something, they had to be a part of a church because what politician could run and claim, I mean, it was hard for a Catholic, right, uh, JFK, to get elected simply because he, he didn't align with, with the masses. How, how much harder would it be to say, I'm an atheist or I'm a, I'm a whatever religion? We've never had a president like that because of the status of what it means to be a Christian. Many people come to the church and, and come to Christ for the status, never thinking about what is the cost for them. I think if there is one big reason that people come to Christ, It's because they're in it, not for anything here. They really, truly want to follow Jesus, but because of the positive thing called heaven. 
that if you mean if I just follow this Jesus, that that one day I'll get to eat pie in the sky for all eternity, that I'll get to see my loved ones again, that if I if I follow Jesus, I get the the best thing ever to go to live forever? That's a positive reason to follow Jesus, but it never considers the cost. There's a lot of people who think that heaven is what they want until they recognize what they've got to pay in the meantime. There's a lot of people who want to come to Jesus for what it gets them, but not many consider the cost of following Jesus. And these are the very ones who they come for those reasons that I just listed. And when it comes down to it, we see the martyrs of the first and second centuries who it costs them having to deny Caesar, deny the government. It costs them their life. It, it, it costs them people turning on them. These are the people who, when times get tough, they fall to the world's temptation who break under the wind of life storms. These are the people who they come for the good stuff, but they walk away from the church because it demands too much of them when they're not getting enough in return. It's the people who haven't truly calculated the cost of following Jesus. And I have to ask you tonight, have you really calculated the cost of what it means to follow Jesus? Have you sat down as the builder for the great tower did and said, yes, I'll have a beautiful building. Yes, it'll be worth it, but this is the bill. Have you, like the king, sat down and calculated all of the moves it's going to take, all of the things that you're going to have to risk in order to be successful in following Jesus? Or have you just said, let's go to battle, not calculating the cost? Because following Jesus may bankrupt you. It may cost you friends. It may cost you your status. It may cost you time and energy. It may be more demanding and difficult than you ever considered. It may land you, oh, I hope not, but there's a day coming, y'all, where if you're not ready, the cost of following Jesus may land you in jail, and it may cost you your life. And there's brothers and sisters in other nations and on other continents who are paying the greatest cost to follow Jesus, and their last words are, Jesus is Lord. It is worth it. Yet for many of us in America, many a church member, many a person who's still on a roll at First Baptist Brooklyn somewhere, they've decided, and this is as simple as it gets sometimes, that I came to this church because I wanted my children to go to to Sunday school here. I wanted this. uh, I wanted that. I wanted. But now, the church is requiring me to be on too many committees. They're asking me to do too much, and I just don't see that it's worth it anymore. You see how you've got your priorities all wrong. And I hope that in here tonight that you're not one of those people, but instead you are one who has considered the cost of following Jesus. That when the trials come, when the bill comes due, when you have to stand firm in your faith, when you have to be mocked and laughed at, when you have to lose friends and family, when that day comes, I hope you consider the cost, yes, but I hope you consider the worth of following Christ as well. Let's not be a church who doesn't put anything on the line. Let's not be a Christian who doesn't consider the cost of following Jesus. Let's not be a people who finds following Jesus to be worth something as trivial even as heaven. Because there's a many a people who follow Jesus simply for heaven. And I was one of them for a long time. But when I recognized that heaven wasn't just a good, a good time, but it was the presence of my Lord for eternity, that that is what I sought, that it was a relationship, it was following Jesus that was more important than anything. That's the most important. That's what makes heaven heaven. But many of us, we might think that it's, it's, it's family, it's loved ones, it's this, it's that. It's going fishing all day and all night for eternity. I mean, there's there's people out there that this is what they look forward to. You've got your priorities all wrong. Count the worth of Christ, but also consider he is worth whatever cost would be demanded of us in this life. Jesus ends with verse 33 for his examples here. He says, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, He cannot be my disciple. Consider the cost. And then he finishes with verses 34 and 35. 
and shows us that costless following, following Jesus that costs you nothing and you get everything in return is actually worthless. Verse 34, another example. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Salt is good, Jesus says, but without essential qualities and characteristics, it's worthless. Salt is good because it's going to make your, your food taste, t- taste you a little bit better. It's going to make that fried chicken pop. Whew. But, yeah, you know, I get fired up about that fried chicken. Um, but if that salt is not salty, if it can't do the job anymore, if it doesn't have that preserving quality that it was used for in Jesus' time, it's worthless. Likewise, being a Christian is good. It is good that the multitudes want to follow Jesus. But if the quality of a true disciple is missing, if it's a Christian who wants to follow but doesn't have the essential qualities of serving the Lord, growing in faith, having a relationship with Christ, if these are not the forefront things on the Christian's mind, then being a Christian is worthless. Following Jesus without sacrifice is not sacrifice at all. In the same way that pouring salt on your food that is not salty at all is worthless, so too is following Jesus yet giving no sacrifice in return. We cannot continue following Jesus thinking, yes, he has given the greatest sacrifice, but there's nothing for me to do in response. The response of walking the aisle, the response of saying Jesus has saved me, the response of following is one where we say, he sacrificed, and now I, in return, I'm going to sacrifice for him. I'm going to give my all to follow him because he's worth however much it would cost me. But I think the most frightening words in Jesus' examples, right before he tells us, those who have ears, let them hear, he says this in verse 35, it is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. This term, cast out, is one from the Torah that talks of casting out sins and unrighteous people and those who are marred by disease out from the camp. It's words of also Revelation where we see Satan and his demons cast out of heaven and out of the presence of God for eternity and locked in a place called hell. This term, cast out, is not a good one. And Jesus' usage of it here ought to open our eyes and open our ears to hear the disciple who does not have the essential qualities, the disciple who is not listening to the demands of what it means to follow Jesus, the disciple who sacrifices nothing, does not have a seat at the Lord's table for eternity. That disciple is not one who is truly a follower of Jesus, but is one who will inherit life eternal in hell. There is such a thing, Jesus talks about it all the time, as a person who calls on the name of the Lord, who does stuff for the Lord, but never truly imagined what it would cost to follow him, who never truly, as verse 26 began it all, loves Jesus more than anything else. And Jesus says over and over again, I know you not, depart from me. We don't want to be the one who is cast out from his presence. And Jesus tells us the way to do that, love me more than anything else. Recognize my worth above all things. And in return, be ready for whatever the cost is. I don't know what it will cost you to follow Jesus. For many people in our days, it doesn't cost a whole lot. We live in a comfortable country where we have the liberty to come into this room and to to preach and to read and to sing praises to the one who created us all. We can live a pretty comfortable life as a Christian. And, and And I hope that that comfort doesn't disguise the worthiness of Christ for each and every one of us. But at the same time, I, I hope for a long time that we can continue to meet and to exercise those liberties. 
But on the other side of things, for a vast majority of people, it costs even their own life to follow Jesus. I don't know what the demands will be, what you'll have to weigh in your own life as the cost of following Jesus. But to weather that storm, the one thing you've got to do, there, there is no, well, if, if, if Al-Qaeda came in here and put a gun to my head and said, will you denounce your faith? I'm going to say no. Nothing can prepare you for that moment other than recognizing the worthiness of who Christ is. That he is truly the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That he has done something and has shown his love for you that no one else could ever do. To recognize the gospel truth that he is God before time, that he stepped down from heaven to live a perfect life amongst us, and that he would lay it all down for you. Until you grasp what he's done and how worthy he is, there's nothing that can ready us to lay down the cost for him in return. And I think that's where verse 35 points back to verse 26. Can you say comparatively that you hate everything compared to the one thing that's worth loving, Jesus Christ? That's what it's all about. Would you bow with me and we'll be dismissed. Father God, we thank you once again for your word and for the opportunity to study it. And Lord, we ask that you would reveal to each and every one of us what it costs to follow you. But more so, Lord, we ask that you would show us your face, that we would feel your presence, and that we would know that it is worth following Jesus, that it is worth loving you for you first loved us, and to consider all that you've done for us. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your sacrifice. And Lord, we pray that we would have the opportunity to give and sacrifice to you in our daily lives. Lord. Help us to consider the cost always and to give of our time, of our energy, of our finances, of all that we have, that we might better serve you. Lord, we thank you and we ask that you would give us safety in our travels home. Continue um, to be with those who are driving vans and give them safety. Continue to keep the word of Jesus in the ears of these little ones in our youth. And Lord, we just pray that you'd bring us back safely again on this Sunday, that we might gather and worship and fellowship again. We ask all of these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.